All right, guys. Tonight's set of notes is entitled Early Compromises Between the North and South. Specifically, we're looking at the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850. Um, and both of these compromises in general relate to the expansion of slavery. As the United States is expanding, geographic expansion during the early and mid 1800s, should slavery expand along with it? And we're going to start with the Missouri Compromise. And let's set the stage <clears throat> looking at political power in, the eight, er, in 1819, um, comparing political power in the North versus political power in the South. So in the Senate in 1819, each section of the country was represented equally. There were 11 northern states and 11 southern states, so each had 22 senators. Uh, the North was more populous. More people lived in the North, so they had more seats in, in the House. There were 108 members of the House of Representatives from the North and 75 from the South. And this leads to, um, and also and there are more electoral votes in terms of the electoral college and voting for the president. There's more electoral votes in the northern states, 130, than there are in the south, 97. Because to get your electoral votes, you just add your senate seats to your house seats. Um, so in 1819, the north controls the house of representatives because there's more people. And it meant that the north also controlled the electoral college. However, the North and South are evenly split in the Senate with 22 seats each. So even though most of the political power was held in the South, having that split in the Senate is really big because this meant that the South could prevent any anti-slavery laws from being passed. It could even prevent Congress from discussing slavery. And because the Senate has the power to approve judicial nominations, the South could also make sure no anti-slavery judges were appointed. This balance of power um, kept things even until 1819, when Missouri applies to become a state. All right. Now, Missouri was part of the Louisiana Purchase, and when they applied to become a state, they said they wanted to allow slavery. And this would shift the balance of power in the Senate from being equal to in favor of the South. So some northern, northern states did not want the South to control the Senate, so they protested. Um, and we have um, a, a conflict, an argument over um, a major issue. And the solution that was reached was the Missouri Compromise. Uh, and the Missouri Compromise had several parts. First of all, Missouri is admitted as a slave state. So the South uh, adds one more slave state to the Union. However, to balance out the addition of Missouri, Maine is also added to the Union, and they are added as a non-slave state. So again, we're still, we've got an equal number of slave states and non-slave states. And Congress didn't want to have to deal with this issue again, so they came up um, with a more permanent, they hoped, solution. And that was drawing a line across the Louisiana Territory, uh, this 3630 line, or the Missouri Compromise line. Slavery was only allowed south of this line. So you can see in this map, um, Missouri came in in the red as a slave state, and Maine came in as a um, non-slave state in the blue. The orange portion of the map, what is the Arkansas Territory, those were, this was area open to slavery. If any states were formed out of this territory, they could come in as slave states. The purple is the rest of the Louisiana Territory, the rest of what was part of the Louisiana Purchase. And any states that came out of this territory would come in as free states. Now, you can look at this map and hopefully you're immediately realizing, but this isn't even all of the United States. It is at the time, in 1820, this is what the United States looked like. But we know in the early and mid-1800s is a time of geographic expansion. And the Missouri Compromise solved the issue of what to do with the Louisiana Territory, but it doesn't solve the issue of what's going to happen when the United States acquires more land. And that's going to happen over the next several decades, which leads to another crisis. And that's why we're going to begin talking about the Compromise of 1850. 
Um, so setting the stage, we're jumping ahead a couple couple decades. So we're looking at 1848. What's changed? What stayed the same? So in 1848, political power in the Senate, the North has 30 seats, and the South also has 30 seats. The North still has more members in the House of Representatives, 139 to 91, which means they also have more electoral votes, 169 to 121. So the North continues to have most of the political power, but the balance of power in the Senate protected the South from anti-slavery laws. However, the U.S. has acquired more land in the last several decades because of the Mexican War. Uh, this land was not covered by the Missouri Compromise, so a decision was going to have to be reached about whether slavery would be allowed in these new territories. By, 18, or by 1850, um, there had been a gold rush in California in 1849, uh, and so California now has enough people to become the state. Abolitionists in the North have become more um, numerous, and they've become more organized, and their voices are being heard more frequently, and they are ardently against allowing slavery in any new territories or states. They, don't, they are totally against the expansion of slavery at all. Um, also at this time is the issue of runaway slaves. Um, you guys know from some crash course videos the work of abolitionists and the Underground Railroad for runaway slaves, slaves who escaped captivity and made it to the north. So at this time, uh, the uh, southern states are really calling for slaves who escaped to be returned to the south, while abolitionists in the north are totally against slaves being or who escaped um, being returned. They think they are safe and they should be free. They've left the states that allow slavery. They are no longer slaves. So in 1850, we have this major conflict going on of what to do about California, what to do about fugitive slaves, and also what to do about slavery in the new territories that the United States just acquired. And that leads us to the actual compromise of 1850. Several things are going to come out of the Compromise of 1850. First of all, California is admitted to the Union as a non-slave state. And this is going to tip the balance of power in favor of the North in the Senate. So there's now going to be more senators from northern states than southern states. In return, the South, well, at least in their opinion, they're getting the fact that new territories are going to be allowed to decide for themselves the issue of slavery. So they will, it's popular sovereignty. The people in these new states as they're being created will get to decide, will they come in as a free state or will they come in as a slave state? And this, this pleases the South because they think most of these new territories will want to come in as slave states. Also, um, the South is getting a stronger fugitive slave law. This fugitive slave law um, forces Northerners to return runaway slaves or face punishment, and it allows slave catchers to go into these northern states, capture runaway slaves, and return them to the south. And then finally, the buying and selling of slaves in D.C. was made illegal. Um, this ends the, the slave trade uh, in Washington, D.C., but not necessarily slavery itself. All right. Um, and looking at this Compromise of 1850, we see both sides do get something, but just like the Missouri Compromise, we're going to see both sides come out of it still angry, not pleased with the final outcome, and a real complete solution to the issue of slavery still has not presented itself.